So we'll be recording this for posting on our YouTube on our website for distribution afterwards. Thanks for coming. We're really excited to see several different teams represented. If you could put your team number in your Zoom username, I think everyone here has that. That would be great. That way we can keep track of who's from which group. Um, our expectation is that this is a graciously professional space, so please keep that in mind in all the interactions. We will have people monitoring the chat, as well as if you raise your hand for questions. Um, tonight, Kyle will be presenting on autonomous tools, some of what we use for auto programs, and then we'll have a lot of time for question and answer after that, either on autonomous and other things we covered or anything else you have questions about. We have several teams here available to answer those. So Kyle, whenever you're ready, you can go. All right. Apologies for audio quality. It might not be the best. If I'm talking too fast, please tell me to slow down. You might want to turn off your video, just yeah. to be safe. Yep. All right. So for this, so contradicting, uh, contradictory, we'll be starting with the more advanced options and working our way down. May need to share your screen, Kyle. Yeah. Right. So the first option, some of you might have seen it with the popularity of Swerve in this recent season, is Path Planner. Look. We got then path plan first, then path weaver, but so path planner is is at least in my experience the easiest one of these one of the two tools to work with, but that's just in my experience, and I don't have as much with path weaver. But So, before we're actually setting anything up, there's a GitHub where you have to download Path Planner. It is relatively easy to find. Just search first robotics Path Planner, and you should find it pretty quick. Yeah. So upon playing it up, we'll get many like this, a lot less features. You'll want to go into the settings and change these. And then here's the important difference between Path Planner and Path Weaver. Path Planner is built to work with Swerve and the other various drive bases. That can move left and right well. Then also up here, you'll select what product you want. And what this does, so if I go back to here. You see all these paths? These are made in here. So mid score, sub score would be this one. And when I change this, let's see what the thorough in there that has been modified. That was what the switch product does. It allows you to have the files be changed and be entered into your program automatically. Okay. So. So, then from there, basic controls, path, then you create the path as false, you drag the points around to say where you want the row to be. Green is the starting point, red is the end point. Then there's these various points in between. 
these dots can be used to adjust the curve. Alongside that, you'll see this reversal. That means that it doesn't turn around and continues going in the direction it arrived at that point. And you adjust what direction you want the robot to be facing by dragging this dot. But obviously, you don't do that for or when you're dealing with more traditional drag. So if we wanted to make a path that starts here, facing backwards so you can score, then exits, and then gets out of the way. You can do so like so. Then feature a path planner that path view doesn't have. You can click preview and see what intends to do. Obviously, this one would not work quite so well because it might collide with the bar on the top, but you get the concept. You can see the new path we created. Then inside of your uh, inside of your auto, what you do is you create a um, path plan trajectory using this. So this exit here is referring to this path. You, you put it in quotation marks the name of the file without the dot path is here alongside the auto constraints which are just, in, at least in this case, the max speed and the max acceleration that a robot can do. So then this takes it into an actual, makes it into an actual trajectory. Yeah. You'll want to choose her, even if you just have one auto, you'll want to choose her because you don't always want to move. <laughs> So, the, so it's very important that you set one of these up before really doing much auto testing. So you create you create your chooser. You say what type of data you want. Then you set the default option. So in this case, our most basic path, which is just driving through the bit. And then we have all of the other paths, which are each of these, respectively. Then we get to events. We have first, you create the various events that you want the robot to do as commands. So this one just says to grab a cone. This one says to spit out of cone, this one says to grab a cube, and so on. Then, can you do? Here is a major difference between Path Planner and Path Weaver. Path Planner has events built into it. I'll show you in a bit. But well, what you do with Path Weaver, well, it's a good to layer. You say say to run a path, and then you more manually say to run the command, and then the path, and then another section of path as a sequential command group rather than just by running one thing. But what the event map allows you to do is it allows you to at where these events are placed. Uh, And then they can read that as the path is being performed. So in this case, it says the score cube, this starting point, 
It starts holding a cube just immediately places one in here. Then it returns the arm to its base position here. Goes over here, so on. Activates to grab this and then proceeds over to the upper scoring point. So you can see the event names here. Let me go into the event map. You'll see ground, which is this one, and grab. So essentially, what that is that loop that allows the users to reach these points, they'll run these, with these being our different instructions for picking up, putting down, moving the arm during the path. Then you have the third trajectory command, which is put in the autonomous init. So this is what is actually told to run once you get to the point of activating the autonomous. So it returns a new sequential command group, a command to be run. Yeah. This is an optional feature. We personally ch choose to have it to give more options. But what this allows us to do is on the dashboard, we can put in a number, and before running the autonomous, it will wait for that amount of seconds. That way, if another robot has a path that conflicts, we can just do this movement. So we, we can wait for them to move out of the way before we go. And there's this, which is part of path planner. And that will just get the various instructions you need to know to realistically run the auto. So you have, say, where we are, set where we are. Here, it's the size of the robot and how far apart the wheels are spread. If we, do, if we are not at where we hope to be, how, much, how fast should we change? Drive events, so all of these. And then this one it just says, once over here, do mirror it, and do mirror it vertically, horizontally, so on. And this. With this version of Pack Planner, the one that has been shown up, it just flips horizontally, but traditionally it also flips vertically because, well, the fields are typically flipped vertically as well. And that's the, the drive subsystem for getting all of these. Then you say run. The selected path. So that's Path Planner. There are a couple of other features to note. So you'll see that some of these have different names. So, what do you do with these? Is mark it as a stop point. And this allows you to have the event and the movement be separated rather than just happening simultaneously. This one, it, it won't stop to do things, they'll just keep on going while running these. And this gives you a few more options. I can put in more events, so I can put in ground here, and then there's parallel, parallel command group. So, one instance of path cleaner, you need to press enter or it doesn't save 
things you type in that just build any convenience. But if I do this, and then you'll see it goes away. If I do and then press enter, you'll see it sticks around. Parallel, parallel runs all these at the same time, sequential one after another. Parallel all at the same time, but there's a time limit in it. If those aren't met, it'll continue. And there's the wait behavior. So you can say, don't wait, which is effectively the same as these. You can say the four, which I believe that one says to that one says to do the movement before the autonomous, the side before the events. After which says to run the events, wait, and then do these. So before, oh, sorry, I'm getting confused. Before means you wait, and then it means not run. After means you do these, and then wait. Then deadline is the equivalent of parallel, of parallel deadline. You, you have a certain amount of time that they'll do before it starts running. And then I'll have to look up, but, it's not one of the ones you're going to be using anyway, using much anyway. A few other details. This is one point where path planner is worse than path leader, but you can measure things. So you can see up in the top right corner that that length is 2.09 meters. So if you want to measure this distance between the two points, you can. Lastly, this is a lot going on, but uh, let's see. Yeah. Somewhere around here, my, ah, here it is, top right, sorry. It says the velocity for the path. So, so different points and velocities. These are just the expected results, not the realistic ones, but what the rotation it is, angular velocity, so on. So th this just gives estimated data for what the different states of the, ro the robot will be in during this. So that's the one I most experience with. But the, but the other commonly used option is path lever, which is like this. Rather than getting it from a GitHub page, this one is built in with the Java, clicking the W, start tool, and then path lever. As you can see here, you can create various paths using it. <laughs> so just similar concept. You drag this around. You select how strong you want that direction to be. You can reverse this one as well. One thing I forgot to mention. With this one, if you want to create a new point, you select the one before where you want it to be, and you double click. So now it goes to that one, and one goes there. This one, what you do is you drag the path like so, and that creates a new point. So, right. You can see here 
the X and Y positions, so I believe in meters. Well, another feature that Path Planner doesn't have, so there is reason to use this one instead. And then here's yeah. so there. With these tools, you'll see that there's not a way to build in events. I mentioned this earlier, but you can't put in events nicely like that I did with Pathfinder. So what we do is you put two paths up, multiple paths up here, and then you'll see that the you can do both paths at once, and you can make paths that starts and end at the same point, which then when you do essentially run this path, you do an event and then run this path. So run this one, event, this one. What that looks like in here. So Choose it again, create a trajectory variable that is what is meant to run. You can just give out the miscellaneous information you want. And then you will define, define the JSON. So if I believe I go up here, so deploy, yes, you'll get these. You essentially say what the file location is for them. So in paths, that's these. So you put your events in the game. Oh, there you go. But you put it on because they're a swerve based one. So this is much more of an example. In I would not expect to run perfectly without testing, but you can see here the chooser, and it chooses sequential command groups with this one being follow this path, then run the event, then follow this path, as mentioned, then this one being follow this path. See here, this one. So this tries to get the JSON file to being a path. And then that path is turned into the trajectory. So you'll see here that it's the same trajectory we need to find up here. And then we get follower, which is the command that you actually use to convert that to something more useful. So you feel it's the trajectory. Uh, when you get position, we don't have RAM seats driving variables, so I put in examples. These are not actual converts. You know, these will be a lot. So just it is data for how the robot drives. So we have checking how fast the wheels are currently going, similar correction tools, the voltage chain, and of course the drive subsystems you can access all of these. And then we will turn that up and but before that, you know, reset the odometry path planner, create a tool for it automatically resets the odometry when, whenever you run it. This one we need to tell it to. So, so before running this, reset the odometry, you are now at the starting position of the path. So it's not setting it to zero, zero. It's saying you are 
here at 1.703, 4 So, as you can see, there's two different sources of path there in path mover. So, uh, I personally would recommend path pointer, but either one has advantages and disadvantages depending on what you do. However, it was a nice amount of effort, and I know that some teams don't have as much, have many programmers, or they're just not fortunate, fortunate to have as much help from mentoring as some of them. So there are alternatives. So, so if this looks like it a lot, don't worry. So this is a zoomed in thing of the API line. And what, what we can do is that you can create your own path with set position, and then you add move position. So you say you want to be here at zero zero, which is zero degrees. Then you want to go to one one, then two one and then to these coordinates as well. So you're creating a trajectory, just like the auto trajectory we had here. And then it's running this without using the tools and just a quicker way to do it. But again, it's very meaningful, especially as you create more complicated paths. So well, that, so well, this suffices for simple things. If you want, if you want to make doing a lot of paths, and it does eventually become easier to just use the tools. And then there's one other option. So, so if you just need an emergency autonomous, you need something. So if you don't need these, and you say it's at the event, and you just want to score a few points in Thomas. What you can do is you can run your you can run your drive function essentially and just say drive forward for three seconds. So just set move, set the direction, maybe set the power or speed. And that, that's all you do. You just put it into here with whatever we want to do, and it'll run that. You, you want to turn it for that as well, because you don't always want to drive through it. Once again, points of having, having a good choose where you do that, but still something you can, but still something you can do with nothing else. Right. Uh, I've been talking a bit fast, do you want me? Yeah, I can still understand you, Kyle. Okay. Now then, there is something to keep in mind. Just because you tell it to go like this will not mean it actually does. There, there are limitations to what the autonomous can realistically do. For example, during our season, we had problems where uh, we will not go to the position we tell it to. We will end up here, sorry, we'll end up here, or here, or here, and just be slightly off. You'll notice this is overlapping with where the code would be. That, that's just a quick correction. But the thing is, the robot will do what it thinks is the correct thing to do. And if you're a dormitory, the system you use to tell for the robot to tell where it is isn't great, then it will proceed to follow that instruction and think that it is here 
the most real science is spun less or is kind of trialless far, it's actually like that. So you can't just so you need to make sure it knows where it is. Some problems with that and said. This strip here, for example, is a bump. And this is the way your biometric works in most cases. And says the wheels rotating this much, they have this much circumference. This is how much we traveled by multiplying those together. Have to feed, have to feel the gear ratios to make sure that it knows how far it's actually rotating. But it, that doesn't count for bumps. So it, it might travel that far, but it might travel that far possibly vertically. So this distance might end up here rather than here. Just because of the large slope that comes with the charging station. That is another factor where if the model is in the air for a bit, it can spin much further than a realistic go traveling ground. So the robot thinks that it has traveled further than it has. There are ways to do it. You can tell it to slow down, you can avoid potential things, or you, you can use vision, which allows you to use the echo tags or line light, and you can be over here. Your camera tells you this is here, and you can get your coordinates off of that. So. Let's see, is there anything else I need to talk about? Do, 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 do. I suppose I can quickly find where the so, do, 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 do. this is the wiki for path planner. What if I must say go here? Uh, it's not... Oh, wait, no, no, no. Sorry. Um, there you go. So I can tell you what that is now. Yeah. So, um, do you want to put the link to this in the chat? Uh, yes. Uh, I'll put the uh, download link. You can link. do that after you're done sharing. That's yeah. easier. So, that's what I mean, as I do remember, but it'll take, uh, at least go to two seconds past the event, say three seconds, but the event is still running, you'll wait for it to finish. So, do, 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 do. Great, I see it. Are there any questions? Yeah, so good questions on this specifically. Let's do those first and then we'll open up to general questions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Kiyush, yeah. you want to go? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, um, but I remember I noticed you had set alliance color to true and we had, we spent week and a half on that and we ended up having our own custom way of flipping them because path planner flipped them for um rotationing symmetrical fields not uh mm -hmm. the field that charged up has so i was wondering how come uh, you were able to use that to work for charged up um i believe it depends on your path planner version but with that i checked and said that at least at that point, it was rotated that way. So, okay, interesting. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, if, um, 
if I can pop in on that, um, that was a path planner bug um, that probably lasted into March or so, maybe. Uh, it did get fixed. Um, and it all, there was also some other condition that was necessary to trigger it. I don't remember what it was, but um, uh, our timing was such in, in how, how we were uh, getting this code done that we were able to take advantage of the fixed version, so. Yeah, and before that, we just carefully designed our paths so that <laughs> the flipping worked okay. Right. Um, we did have an instance, however, where the flipping led the robot to, uh, or it was either the flipping or the non-flipping that caused the robot to uh, think it was in the wrong place. And instead of starting off down the field, it took off at a high rate of speed across the field, um, which was exciting on our small practice field. So yes, you got to be careful about that. And that's a reminder to have someone on disabled, even when you're not manually operating, especially yeah. when you're not manual operating, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Did that answer your question, Kish? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, interesting. Um, I wonder if you something. So not past that, but we would want to flip very free. But just for this season, we change the version so that saying true only flips it horizontally, horizontally. So, so we now do have a lot version path where you get next season if you use it, because it might not have changed back by that point. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, interesting. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The field this year was uh, different than recent past seasons in that it wasn't symmetric. Um, for you couldn't use the same paths uh, for as red and blue. You had to use different paths. So, um, I had a question, Kyle. Um, you talked about the event map. Um, does the event map get used for all of the paths? Is there just one event map for all of the paths, and therefore you have to be careful to name the events differently in the different paths? Uh, we have one event map. I found that to be a good thing because a lot of the different events, you're going to be doing, well, scoring a cube in a bunch of them. So you can use the same event for all of them without an is issue. Ah, uh, cool. So, however, there is that one problem we came up we ran into. If you have multiple usage of scoring cubes, you can only use the same command once per autonomous. Uh, this is mentioned as a uh, nuisance with VS uh, code that they arrived yesterday. But we had to create. Well, you, you notice this zero still lingers. But yeah, you have to shoot out and shoot out zero. Because if we try to run. This one multiple times in the in the watch on this, it gets unhappy. So you have to kind of run this and then run this rather than yeah. right, because you can't reuse the same instance of a command between multiple command groups. Right. And so this was more efficient than what we did last year when I was in charge of this, and we were trying to figure this all out, which was to make like tons of instances of the same type of command. Yeah which works, but it's not very efficient. Yeah. Well, and it results in a lot of extra code. <laughs> right, that was the main thing. <laughs> That's the main thing. Not very efficient of the programmer's time. Um, let's see. Um, oh, uh, next question, Kyle, was uh, there are some PID constants in the path following. Um, do you remember how we came up with those? Uh, I can tell you what my recollection is, but uh, uh, I, yours is more likely to be right than mine. So, and, and it's an interesting question. I don't remember how we got the values, but I remember what these went to be. So this means that in the X and Y directions, so just on the ground, not just moving back and forth, is how many meters per second 
you know, do come be a of error. So if it wants to be at zero zero, or if that's zero one, or it thinks it is, then it will drive at 3.5 meters per second to zero zero in order to correct alongside whatever movement is already doing for the path. When theta is a rotation, so remember if it's radians, probably radians, but they rotate five radians per second per radian of error. So I don't remember how we got those values, but those are what we need. Trial and error, I suspect. Possibly. Okay. Um, anybody else have questions? I'm sort of, I don't want to hog things here. Um, yeah, Josiah. All right. So you mentioned um, the possibility of uh, bumps or climbs interfering with an autonomous uh, routine. Is there a way or is there uh, coming a way to integrate April tags to account for stuff like that? It can yes. recenter based oh. on where it thinks it is based on the April tag. Yeah, that, to my knowledge, that's the main use of vision. So you can look at April tags or green light and you can extrapolate your position off of that to make corrections. So that, I think that's something that the teams with no vision experience did so that they, their autonomous is more accurate. But that's a major reason why to have vision. I know we have a couple teams in here that have used able tags more than we have. Sonic Corals or CPR, do you have anything to add on that topic? Yeah, so definitely, like, able tags is a definitely a big one for making autonomous more reliable. Um, for the most part, let's say, let's take last year's game field, for example, which was completely flat. Um, because it's so flat, you can almost get away without having vision, because even if you get drift, you can just offset your paths to manually account for that. And you kind of end up where you can use uh, vision. It's definitely helpful where you don't need to. But this year, especially because you had that bump on one of the sides of the community, you almost had to use vision to get correct that, because uh, while you could offset it manually, it was kind of random how your robot would react to it sometimes so that's something that we we did a lot is focus on our vision and tomorrow when we're going to present uh, some of our stuff that's going to be one of our topics is it's vision and how we use that in our autonomous does that answer your question josiah yes it does thank you Anybody else? Well, I have one more observation <laughs> that that I was reminded of. You know, last night we talked about uh, gotchas in uh, mm -hmm. the organization of the software code, and Kyle's description of autonomous reminded me of another one. Um, so um, he talked about doing reset odometry um, on the uh, on the odometry, and this is a, a method um, of the odometry object that's sort of used throughout the path following. Um, typically, you have an odometry object in your in your drive base, maybe that tells you uh, essentially where the robot is um, and what direction it's facing. Um, and one thing that we learned. Uh, fairly on this season was that you really want to implement that reset odometry um, function uh, strictly in terms of the odometry and not in terms of the sensors that are being used to um, calculate the odometry. So, so for example, uh, one way, one way of resetting things prior to running a path uh, that we used to use was we'd reset the sensors, uh, the encoders, reset the encoders to zero for the um, drive base encoders. Um, and not only is that perhaps uh, a more confusing way to do it, with uh, the CAN-based encoders, it's actually uh, it causes race conditions where immediately after doing that, 
the encoders may not yet have reset and so you start getting um, errors in your readings from the sensors because they're not they're not reading what you expect them to read. So uh, Peter Johnson from WPI Lab had been suggesting pretty strenuously to people on Chief Delphi and other places that uh, rather than doing a reset of the sensor, do a reset of the reading that the sensor supplies um, and just work off of a off of a single street stream of readings from the sensors and never actually reset the sensors but rather reset the accumulators um as that say where what the, what the what the meaning of a given uh sensor reading is and and we followed that uh pretty strictly this year and it worked really well um and uh not ever going to go back to resetting doing reset operations on sensors because uh, with CAN based sensors, uh, I think it's doomed to, to fail um, in nasty ways. Maybe some of the other teams have comments about that too, but um, uh, that, that was a lesson learned this year. Yeah, that was, that was also something that we had to tackle with. It's early, I think it might have been either last year or early this year, where we had that issue where we were um, not for the Falcons on the server modules, but for the Pigeon IMU, we were calling the reset for the IMU itself instead of resetting the offset in the odometry. So that would cause weird issues where we would reset the IMU to be zero, but the offset that the odometry object knew was still alive and it was still using that. So it would just kind of spin randomly. Um, so yes, that was sir. definitely a big important lesson. Yeah. Okay, any other autonomous questions or comments? Or if not, if anyone has any, oh, Kiyush, did you have something? Yeah, I just had one more. Um, so this season, one of the kind of the struggles we had with autonomous, which we kind of just hacked together, is finding. Let me let me try to get the exact names. I think it's uh, for the feed forward values like KS, mm -hmm. uh, KV, and KA. There's a couple of ways of doing that. Where I think one of the ways is society, and uh, we tried using society, and it just didn't end up working out for us. It just gave us terrible bogus values. So I'm wondering if anybody had success using society for getting uh, those values served. No, <laughs> not us. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, I think if we'd had more time, we had we had ideas about what to do as far as locking down the um, the 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 rotation of the swerve modules and just having them go straight and and taking measurements that way but we ended up with not enough time to do to do that so for us the um how did we do this um the the default values in the wpi live swerve uh, example code were sort of adequate um i mean i don't think we didn't have great uh correspondence between the odometry and the actual position on the field but it was pretty good and the path following was pretty good um so uh, that's pretty much what we used and then we did a little bit of experimenting with the um particularly the the PD for the um, rotation of the swerve modules. Uh, we we had initially uh, swerve modules that were much too uh, lackadaisical about getting to the correct angle. And so we had to experiment a bit with that to get them to turn quickly to the correct angle. But uh, yeah, um, this idea is not an really an adequate tool for swerve and there isn't a good um, I haven't seen any mention of anybody with a with a sysid like thing for swerve that uh, 
they say works and, and i don't know why but i haven't seen it <laughs> yeah this like we tried using society we like physically zip tied the modules they wouldn't rotate and mm -hmm. use society but even then the numbers that it was giving out were just wrong um hmm. so like okay. it was something in the sense that the we we're thinking that it might have been because we were using um i forget the name of it but it's the the ctre product that gives you more canvas bandwidth um, oh yeah uh, uh canivore canivore so yeah. we were thinking it might have been because we we're using a canivore because that was like a new feature that they just added as support but mm -hmm. it seemed like that was kind of working and then we got to we had to run but then when we did run it it just gave us terrible values um and we ended up just looking at the defaults from like you mentioned wpi lib and then comparing it to some of our older robots which we somehow calibrated which i don't remember how we calibrated <laughs> um and we compared the weights and then we just kind of drew a graph there and picked the point that looked well enough but we were hoping that society would be something that some teams figured out yeah that's this is interesting because i don't like i said uh, last time I do tend to monitor the issues and uh, discussions on the WPI Live GitHub site, and I don't remember seeing any discussion this summer about SysID, so I, I'm a little worried that it's not going to get better. Um, have to take a look at that one, um, see what's going on. Um, the guy who uh, is in charge of that is a fairly brilliant mathematical coding guy and so um if he works on it i'm sure it will get much better but um like i said i haven't noticed anything going on Would but if someone really... does figure it out please let us know because we'd be it... very interested in the solution yeah um because uh we could certainly make good use of a good sys id for for swerve um that reminded me of something else which i don't oh yes <laughs> sort of this is now branching out beyond autonomous uh to other things and hopefully people will have questions uh you know don't don't stand on protocol raise your hand if you want to or just jump in um with swerve um and autonomous it is really essential that you keep your units straight uh, throughout the code. Um, you keep the um, keep the notion of what is positive rotation and negative rotation straight, uh, that you keep the measurements if you're doing radians, that you always do radians. If you're doing degrees, always do degrees. Uh, we screwed that up this year. <laughs> we did our module rotation in degrees and our uh, robot rotation in radians. I don't quite know why. Um, and similarly, meters per second, feet per second, uh, just just you know, set out with the goal of being completely consistent about that. Um, the, and what is positive in the x direction what is positive in the y direction uh just make it make it completely consistent um and the problem that we found with swerve is that you can have inconsistencies in all of that and have stuff have a robot base that you can drive perfectly fine with your with your uh, robot controller um but then when you try to do autonomous, it's all broken again. So um, you know, we went through that um, and it turned out to be mixing up of directions, largely mixing up of directions um, about what's positive and what's negative. Other questions, comments? Yeah, t tell us about what worked and what didn't work and and what you learned to be careful about that. That's all all very interesting to us and I'm sure to other teams as well. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Young, we haven't heard from you at all. Did you have anything you wanted to share about CPR as anonymous or anything in your code base? Um, I'm just kind of getting back into my head back on this. <laughs> it's very, very refreshing to see, um, to hear everybody's, uh, I guess, uh, recap of software. I'm, I'm more in charge of uh, the entry level programming side of things. Yeah, and we did have, uh, we did use uh, uh, team, uh, the Vantage Kit for our autonomous. And we did also using that for, I'm not sure if you, because I was late a couple of days, both days, so late apologize for that. And we did use, one thing we did with um, using Advantage Kit to use for the simulation mode that was really useful. So um, Meg team typically don't deliver anything that's uh, tunable like until like fifth week. And then we're able to do a lot of things before that. So that was really, that's, that, that proven to be very, very beneficial. But with, so when the Meg team delivered their, the, the, the robot, uh, we were able to get it going within a week. That was very different mm -hmm. from our previous years. Yeah, how about you guys' experience? Did you guys use any of the simulation set of things of the Vantage Kit? So we didn't use Advantage Kit. We just used Advantage Scope to look at the logs. A um, couple of years ago, we used simulation very extensively for um, infinite recharge at home. Um, infinite recharge at home, we programmed all of that uh, with simulation and Put it on the robot very very late uh, and it was very successful um, the thing that has uh, been difficult for us in the last couple of years is that um, i haven't had time as as the mentor most having to do with simulation i haven't had time to really understand um, how to get simulation for swerve and also simulation for um, like the Falcon 500 and uh, Neo motors uh, to to work. I, I just don't, I, I haven't figured that out. And so I haven't been able to point any of the students at, at uh, building simulation because it doesn't yet make sense to me how that's supposed to work. So are you, if you're suggesting that Advantage Kit makes that uh, a little easier, we'll be definitely looking at that because we're very impressed with the Advantage scope and we know that team is supplying some good stuff. I did use simulation in 2022 for the autonomous driving because we still had tank drive at that point. Right. And so uh, we used simulation combined with CAD to do so, almost so all autonomous but tasks. weren't you just using the simulation that was in that was in pathweaver i don't and think and we i was using the one we had on smart dashboard uh, i was using one that we had embedded in smart dashboard the one that's built into pathweaver and a cad model that i just like made a square okay. that's shaped the robot on combined uh, okay not very efficient because you have two screens <laughs> but it worked but so. it worked yeah so but it's a it's a powerful tool um, uh, and uh, hooray for <laughs> for being able to make use of it uh, um, we had to, we did a lot of um, work with our prototypes uh, for the grabber our initial grabber and the arm um, which were which was very valuable we also didn't really have a working robot until um, until pretty late in the season. Oh, we did we did have a a swerve drive base that was different motors and different weight and everything about the same size. So we did a lot of work with that. Um, yeah, because um, we've moved away from having an entire secondary robot since Bag and Tag yeah. has gone away. We haven't done that, but we've tried to get like as close to the real thing as we can as early as possible. We have a board bot we can hook up like the electronics of robot. We can hook prototypes too. And that gives us a lot more hands-on experience.
2930 also used advantage kit pretty heavily this year. Um, and we had a similar experience with CPR where we were able to test a lot of our code even before getting the physical robot. It helped a lot with our development on the practice field. I think I was actually lucky enough to talk to one of the CPR programmers, actually see their uh, mechanism in advantage kits. So that was super, or advantage scope. So that was super cool to see. Um, and uh, I think a third of our talk tomorrow, the 2930 is going to give, is going to talk about advantage scope and specifically to your point, Carl, is how to get started with that. So we found a really good library um, that kind of had Swerve and Advantage Kit and Simulation kind of all built in. Uh, mm -hmm. It was 3061 lib, so the FRC team 3061. And that was one of the things we were going to talk about tomorrow as well. So great. expanding on that tomorrow would be great. Something Aiden, I, I was going to ask Aiden if he had any uh, questions or thoughts. We're not, you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. All right, this should work. That's better. Yes, now we, now I'm All hearing right. you. I did have questions and then I lost them. I'm kind of just taking notes. <laughs> okay. Well, if any if any of them come back, uh, chime in. <laughs> yeah, you've got my contact information, so feel free to reach out at any point. Yep. Something that got briefly mentioned that I know we've played around with different methods is how do your teams like train up and bring on new programmers, especially if they don't have a lot of coding experience? Like none. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I have something to add to that since I am training up the, we, we develop our programming team into a programming, one, programming one and programming two, and I am do the one. So we obviously train them up on Java and that, cause we use that as our uh, uh, preferred language. And we pretty much um, use, um, was a little baby robot that we did. Um, oh, I've totally forgot my, I had a good summer, I guess you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Romy. Uh, yes. So I was able to get every all the programming student, programming web students, to working on that, and then really get familiar with um, all the um, the ins and outs of how the different um, classes are working with each other, and how do we make um, even simple uh, drivetrain to work, and then um, just have them deal with uh, all the inputs, and so that's really good way for them to get used to all these um, components. So so that's kind of what I've been working with them for the last couple of years using Romy's. Yeah. Uh, do you have any mechanisms on your Romy's other than just the drive base? I just take one of the motors out to say, hey, it, pretend this is a uh, elevator. Ah, cool. So, so I'm able to ask them to control one independently and then the other one, and then maybe cause them to like pretend one is elevator, one is just just make believe whatever that mm -hmm. one motor is what, and then just have them, um, yeah, just yeah, ju just and I, and I suppose you could sort of lift it up in the air and put some weight off, you know, hang a stick with a little weight off the end, and then you really do have something that is uh, different than driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So cool. yeah. The main thing I, I would train them on, I did a lot of a training on just ask them to, especially um, joystick inputs. So um, they able to use a lot of the um, different events, like while while pushed, um, mm -hmm. that sort of things. They would able, so I pretty much give them a lot of uh, practice on like all of the, when the driver wants to do this or that, how would you trigger an, an event? Mm -hmm. And then, so that was really helpful. And plus, there are a lot of LEDs. There are a few LEDs on Romy that they we can use that mm -hmm. for switching, mm -hmm. um, testing out uh, things that happens when you push a button. One of the things we um, practice on is um, we did a lot of this last three years now. I think is when you when something event is true, your um, your um, your Xbox controller vibrates. So that gives some a very quick feedback for the driver uh, when something happened. 
And then we're able to have, uh, let's say the, the operator um, will be look, perhaps looking at uh, uh, a cone, for example, uh, on the ground, whether it's push into the behind the line, and then that, that operator will push the button and then the driver will feel that and then know that it's done because the driver can't see it. So we're able to communicate between driver and operator using vibrate. So that was cool pretty, pretty fun. Yeah, we haven't, done, we haven't done anything with the vibrate function, so that's yeah. What are they called? What do they call that? Rumble. Rumble. Yeah. 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 So I was able to play, uh, have all the programming one students play with those um, act things that they can. So they f they feel very comfortable with anything has to do with input. Nice, and yeah. and they and that that's where they then learn that pushing the stick forward is a negative number and uh, <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, we pretty much stick with a very basic traditional robot um, uh, convention. So mm -hmm. X positive is. Uh, away from the driver and then yeah. Y positive is to your left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so speaking of controllers, um, uh, that reminds me of another story um, that, <laughs> that maybe if I tell it, it will save somebody some trouble in the future. So we used, uh, what were they called? Ghoulie uh, controllers this year. Um, and they are very nice. They're, they cost about the same as an Xbox controller, but they have Hall Effect um, sensors for the joysticks. And they don't drift. Uh, they're, they're just really smooth. And, and I, I used one, and I just loved it. Uh, the, the, the drive team were the one who suggested these. And so we bought a couple of them. Um, however, we learned a very sad lesson <laughs> um, uh, in the finals at district championship. Um, the um, controller would not work. Um, and we thought we had a very, we were doing our, we were doing our short system test just before going on the field. Um, I don't know if you no, but we were called on as a substitute for the final match um, and it didn't work. And we thought that something was seriously wrong with the robot. Uh, and so things got disabled and we didn't try to do things and a lot of other things. And what we learned when we got back home and dug into this was that the Ghoulie controllers actually have a mode that couples um, I, I think it's called automatic pilot auto aiming. auto aiming that couples some of the controls on the on the on the controller together. And so whenever we were trying to do one thing, it was issuing contradictory commands from the other controller, from the other con other control on the controller. And so that was kind of a disaster. And we didn't even know these controllers had that possibility. Now we do, and we will know what to do if it happens again, but it was kind of disappointing <laughs> for the for the for that match. But anyway, um well we were glad to figure out that the robot wasn't broken, however. So anyway, I thought I'd tell that story because one of the one of the lessons of digital stuff these days is people try to make it smart and um, it can cause it to do surprising things. Um, not just not just controllers, but robot software and all kinds of different things will do that. Um, another question for everybody. Um, did you use coprocessors on your robot? And if so, what? What were they and what were they for? I had a couple of questions about the Romy. We can talk about that really quickly. Sure. Uh, uh, this so, is kind of a free fall for all yeah. here. So let's go where where we want to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, uh, since you guys had um, success working with the Romy's as a CPR, I was, so we tried doing, using them in the off season and 
what we noticed was that in school environments, we weren't sure if it's because of uh, how the school network was set up or, or what, but they would keep disconnecting and they wouldn't stay connected to the laptops for more than 10, 15 seconds. So I was wondering if uh, CPR had any of those similar issues like that. Um, no, we didn't have any problem with connecting. Okay. Um, yeah, unless your, your Wi-Fi has some sort of a kill switch of anything that is interfering with certain I'm not sure. I heard that there's something like that, but we never had a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because one of our mentors was suggesting that might have been the reason because the school Wi-Fi was like, somehow hostile uh, yeah. to their networks, but we weren't sure how to even test that or because we also had some times where the our competition robot just refuses to connect sometimes uh, over over Wi-Fi, so we should use a tether in the school. Um, but like outside or you know in the practice field or anywhere else, it's completely fine. Yeah, so. I did. We did one year um, has a lot of issues. So I talked to our IT and then um, they told us that there is, there is nothing they do to quote unquote kill any <laughs> nearby Wi-Fi. So interesting. Maybe you need so, to talk to your school admin or IT support to see if there's anything and just explain to them what this is what you're doing and then see if they have something they, they, they know that you didn't know. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So we had similar problems, not this past year, but the year before uh, in the school environment. Um, and in our case, switching the robot from 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi to 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi made a huge difference. Um, didn't completely solve the problem, but, uh, you know, tr try both. <laughs> see if one is better than the other uh, okay. the, the robot radio is programmable we'll definitely look into that, that. Um, you should, are you using school computers or just on the school network or, so from what it's been a long time since i used the Romy, but if i remember correctly the Romy made its own wi-fi you can to the right. Romy wi-fi yes. yeah um Romy does its own ssid yeah from what I remember, we we're using, it was a mix of both personal laptops and school laptops, and they would both have issues. Because yeah. I know school yeah. computers can have weird. Exactly. Yeah. That's what we yeah. thought at first, too. But since also the personal laptops would get messed up, we kind of, something kind of just threw away. We're like, why it's going on? Yeah. And and what I said about five gigahertz didn't apply to the Romy. That was just for mm -hmm. the ro big robot. Um, Another quick question I had um, is 2930 is also looking into perhaps trying out a system of programming where we have a programming one and programming two. I was wondering if you guys have any resources or CPUs put anything out um, that we can perhaps look at for training material. Um, I kind of use um, a book that I use um, that UW is using to train their first year Java. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the name of that? It's called Pro Java Programming. Um, no, what is the name of that book? Well, there's there's a series of textbooks called Programming Java, Programming C++, Programming Python. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. No, there's a book about. that uh, it's written by a UW computer science professor. Ah, okay. Um, that's not this it, series. It, it's... Let's see what I'm let's see if I can my headphone is long enough I can look, look. <laughs> it's called building Java programs um, by R Regis and strap okay thank you yeah that's us uh, and is there along with just general Java programming concepts yeah, just general there... Java programming so so once they have to get to um, working with classes and creating objects, and that's the main thing. Um, so they have to understand what is the difference between classes and objects. So once you're there, that's taken care of. They don't even have to know. Well, I mean, once you get to that and then, uh, then you switch over to command base and that's already they need to know. Mm -hmm. um, they gotta be good at uh, doing logical stuff, 
like Boolean math. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the main thing that I have them train on. Um, you know, don't, I, I kind of uh, tell them, don't worry about wild statements. <laughs> <laughs> don't get good at any of that stuff. I don't want them to think that wow, because if you do wow, you get into a lot of trouble. Carl, yeah. you probably know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so um, we've been doing um, a summer workshop for just anybody who wants to come. Not, not a lot of the students uh, end up coming for the robot team, but a few have. Um, and uh, we've just been helping the kids get through uh, the. The I think it's called Java Introduction on Code Academy, and um, you know we help them get signed up. We help them navigate the the foibles of Code Academy. We we uh, last summer we did it in three three hour sessions. Um, this year we did it in four two hour sessions, which was better. Uh, three hours is too long for kids that age um, and old folks my age to sit in a hot building and uh, <laughs> and and code. So uh, four two hour evening sessions we get through um, we get through objects. Um, uh, expressions data types. Uh, and we also objects. have them skip loops. And, and we also <laughs> skip the lesson on loops. Um, <laughs> but we we do talk about arrays. Uh, some of the kids get to arrays. It, it's self-paced, so they get as far as they get. But it, I think it's a pretty nice little introduction uh, for uh, people who haven't programmed, even people who haven't programmed before at all. Um, uh, we had one student who, a couple of students who previously programmed in Python. Um, they found it interesting. And then we had a lot of students who'd never programmed before and they all they all said they liked it. So um, I, you know it's not it's not maybe the best material, but it it works and uh, it, they immediately get to start writing code and trying stuff out. And I like that about it uh, uh, without having to learn about compiling and class files and all that stuff that was on the code academy you said right uh-huh okay thank you josiah what did you and maybe gauge if this applies to you as well what did you guys use to start learning programming uh we use just the basic Java tutorial on W3 schools. Well, that's what I use. Yeah, I ended up using a little bit of that as well, uh, but mostly I uh, learned or gained a more complete understanding through the Code Academy course. Yeah, and then and then once people have done that, then then we start pointing them at little pieces of the WPI live documentation. Um, the, the zero to robot is pretty interesting. Um, for the students more interested in software, it gives them a bit of a picture of what the hardware is actually all about, which is important that people acquire knowledge of that um, along the way. Um, uh, we didn't use uh, this particular thing, but this has been around for a while. It's called STEM Robotics. Have you? Has anybody heard of that? No. Um, let me put this link to the chat, and then we never used it, but I looked at it. It's, it's very comprehensive, comprehensive for robotics, seems like. Uh, let's see if I can, where is the chat? Okay. It's called. Uh, yeah, I see it from from um, from EDX uh, Portland State. Is that Portland State? Yeah, Portland University? State. Yeah. Has anybody seen this before? Because I used no. it um, for my own, just kind of checking to see, make sure I'm not missing anything. And it's very uh -huh. seems to be very comprehensive. But the only thing that I did not, it, this 
does not have as many pra- um, exercises for the students. Mm-hmm. So it's a good topical, um, kind of like a checklist to see if you make sure that you got it. So that this might be a good way for uh, a mentor to kind of check off and then see which one they want to cherry pick and train their students. Mm-hmm. Nick, and that has Lee, a Nick Lee, could you look into that and give us a report about that uh, early in the season? Be very interested to know <laughs> what yeah. you think of that. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, I'll start working Nick? on that. Nick was a first year software student last year. And so awesome. he's awesome. going to be one of our main guys this year. Awesome. And that also mentions EV3 for Java programming, which is something we've tried to figure out in the past and hasn't quite been working. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just kind of gave up. I, I was thinking doing Python for the, for my, oh, I, we train middle schoolers. Um, I started working with uh, sixth graders. And any, I, I bring on one or two sixth graders uh, once a week to kind of get them really slow on learning Java and then figure by three, in three years, they'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, I used to code NXT, which was before EV3 with like a yeah. robot C mm-hmm. type thing. That was kind of like C, but they already made all the functions for you. Oh, yeah. But I haven't been able to find the documentation that I used because that was yeah. quite a while ago. I, I kind of start working with sixth graders. Um, if they can sit through three years of this, uh, 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 be able to pay attention and still have the ha- the passion to work on it, that's kind of the people I want <laughs> when they're not <next> great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah, it's, uh, so they, they obviously is optional. They can come and go whenever they want. And uh, I use that as kind of just to see who has the, the personality to, to uh, learn. And obviously, if they want to come in, you know, when they're in eighth grade or ninth grade, I'm okay with that too. But yeah. That's cool. We usually start our, we do workshops for younger kids, but then we start text based coding in seventh to eighth grade. Yeah. 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 Cool. Other questions, observations? Um experiences that you'd like to share about robot software anyone so kiush could you uh review the topics you guys are going to talk about tomorrow night um and uh we're really looking forward to some of the things that you have to say and like to get everybody excited about it. Sounds good, yeah. I, I may even be able to pull up the PowerPoint and give you a brief like preview of it. Oh, sure. That would be of interest. Yeah, yeah. It's going to take me a second to find it. One moment. <laughs> Eventually, okay. Cool. Let's see if I can share my screen. If it if it will let you if it won't let you share, I can make <laughs> you a co-host. Let's see. Okay. Looks you guys like able to see that? Six, yep. That works. Okay. So kind of the skimming through stuff. We have 361 libs. So this is talking about Swerve, how you know what it was, uh, why we use a library, talking about some vision. So then that so talking about advantage kit too, I think somewhere in here. So advantage scope, advantage kit. Um, once we get past the Swerve library, kind of dive into that. Um, after the Swerve library, you know, give, giving a basic overview of what um, advantage kit looks like. You know, pointing to additional resources, all that. Um, then you know, we have a couple of demos with using advantage kit, how we use that in the season. Um, some of our <laughs> autonomous uh, failures and successes um, and how we how we use advantage kit for that. Uh, this super cool video, um, which I found pretty interesting is kind of a comparison between a, a real life video versus a um, advantage kit replay of that. Where we can see the April tags we saw and the auto printer running. So we'll talk more about that in depth tomorrow. Um, and then kind of finishing off with 
the, the vision localization. Um, the entire PowerPoint basically follows our journey this year, um, going from finding a sort of library to implementing Advantage Kit to using vision. So it's definitely very close to what we actually did as a team this year. Um, and then once we go into um, vision, we have some topics about how we structure our autonomous. So um, talking about like the, the custom uh, implementation we had for autonomous to make it as clean as possible. Um, you know, for example, comparing our uh, most complex auto last year on the left side to our most complex auto this year on the right side. See, it's much less code, much cleaner. Um, talking about that, uh, the advantage of that, how modular it was, and then uh, yeah, just finishing off with a Q and A. That's kind of kind of what tomorrow is going to look like. Really looking forward to that. that. That should be very helpful. So, I also wanted to mention before we hop off, since we have quite a few people here, we are looking at hopefully having this seminar be an annual thing, assuming people are finding this useful. So if your teams are interested in being part of this, or if you're watching the recording later, let us know. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to have more presenters. We, you know, uh, we, this is our first go at this. We did it three evenings in a row. Um, if we had more presenters, we could maybe turn it into something that happens once a week over a longer period of time. Um, completely flexible about that, but uh, we're so excited that uh, Kiyosh and Sonic Squirrels uh, leapt into the into the fray to uh, participate in this, and we'd love to have more. So, uh, yeah. You want to wrap it up, Laura? Yeah, I think that's all I have tonight. So we don't have anything else. I think I have all of your emails from yesterday. I don't think we have any new people today for distribution afterwards. We've had some communication on Discord about the seminar. Aiden, thanks for keeping people in the loop. I plan to release all the videos after tomorrow, just for ease of distribution, but they'll be on a YouTube or a website. So Great. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you Thank tomorrow. Thank you. Good night. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening.